So, um, we're going to go, uh, we're going to have a bit of philosophy now. I'm going to introduce again Stephen and Ronnie with their Twitter bios. Uh, is you <coughs> Ronnie. Ronnie Lil Anjum, philosopher, cares a lot about causation, part of team Mung Jum, not necessarily the better half, opinionated. <laughs> yes. And um, Stephen actually said to me, it was, it was shorter than Emma's, he said, um, I said, oh, what, have you written down your Twitter biography? He said, yes, Stephen Mumford is. <laughs> <laughs> Forever the philosopher. Uh, and then he's written a bit more. Is uh, professor of philosophy at the University of Nottingham, but shortly moving to Durham to be closer to, to normal. <laughs> Um, Ronnie and Stephen, everybody. Oops. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to use the microphone so that... Can you hear me now in the back? No problems? Yes? So Stephen and I were going to talk a bit more about the ontology, uh, about the philosophical assumptions that are lying behind any form of scientific practice and also theory. So, in the context of this conference, there has been a lot of Twitter debate, and I have seen that some have been very critical. I'm not sure if any of those are here. Uh, of course, health as criticizing the EBM scientific framework. So the idea is that if you want to be scientific about medicine or health sciences, you better stick with the evidence-based framework because that equals science. And if you start criticizing that or saying we should do something else, then you're moving away from science and into some more wishy-washy, wacky, what is and touchy feely, but in this context, that's pretty hardcore. <laughs> yeah. So, that's not at all the point of cause health. So, cause health is, on the contrary, it's the idea that evidence, if we want to have evidence of causation, we first need to know what it is causation is. So, what type of evidence? I mean, the type of evidence we gather, it has to depend on what it is that we're looking for. So that's why we are starting from what we would call an ontological perspective about the nature of causation. So ontology is about our most fundamental assumptions about reality. So when we say that we have found evidence of causation, we are assuming that there are such things as causes and effects, in the world. And if we're going to go and look for them, we would say it's a good idea to first know it, what it is it, we are looking for, so that we can use the best methods that map onto it. Because we think methods and ontology, they go hand in Okay, so that's the idea. So I'm going to try to spell that out a bit. So this, this one. Okay, you don't have to look at that yet. So what is causation? As Roger already said, Hume, David Hume, he had one idea. He said causation is about regularity. So events happening regularly after each other. And preferably, any kind of causation should give you a perfect correlation. Okay, so perfect correlations, we don't often get that in our data. But we can think that the reason why we don't get perfect correlations is because that we haven't been able to single out exactly the one cause and, and prevent all the interferers from uh, coming into the picture. So he thought that we should look for perfect regularities. So you can see how if we think that causation is something about perfect regularities, then finding really good correlations, strong, robust correlations, should get us closer to finding causation. Okay, so that would be what we did. So, so if actually Hume was right that perfect regularities is the same as causation, then we shouldn't need anything more than statistical data. Okay, we should just stop there. I'm going to try to use this thing. Uh, he thought regularity. Okay. 
And then the idea of this is that you have the ontology here, which is fitting very well to Hume. And then you have the scientific approach here that fits to the Hume ontology. Okay. And then for each line, you can read it horizontally so that you see that the, what you have here matches what you have there. I can see now why people swirl them because it's very hard to, you know, <laughs> hold them still. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, another view that he was presenting was the difference making view. If it hadn't been for the cause, you wouldn't have the effect. So, if we think that causes are something that make a difference to the effect, mm -hmm. then it makes perfect sense to look for those difference makers. So we would use comparative methods. In one case, you have the factors that you think is the cause, and you see if you get the effect. And then you have a context that is similar, where you don't have the, what you think is the cause, and then you see if you get the effect. And then at least you should have the effect more often in the case where you have the, what you think is the cause, than in the group where you don't have the cause. So, if you then look at these kind of RCTs or other comparative studies, it suggests that causation is something that should make a difference to the outcome. Okay, so you can see how that would be a good idea. These two things aren't necessarily the same. The statistical correlations <coughs> is not the same as the difference makers. Okay. So the RCTs and the correlation data are not the same. There are many other theories. Uh, one is that causation is about energy transference, where you transfer energy from the cause to the effect. That's a more physicalist theory. Uh, one is that causation is something that you can manipulate, so that you manipulate the cause to bring about the effect. That works very well with you if you do experimentation, where you want to see what happens if I do this and this. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a statistical approach. It doesn't have to, uh, it can be that you're trying to understand some causal mechanisms, perhaps in the lab. Okay. So we want to say that if we look at how evidence-based medicine is looking for causes, it fits very well with Hume's <coughs> notion. It also fits well with an ontological perspective that we can call positivist. So I don't know how many people here know about positivism, but in social science there was a huge debate where positivism was criticized and uh, we tried to leave that behind. But in medicine there hasn't been such a debate. But I think it's time to take it. Uh, because positivism, it comes from Hume, who was a very strict empiricist. He thought that the only thing we can really know is what we can observe directly or experience directly. And anything that has to do with theories, I mean, we cannot observe a theory, we can observe data, but we cannot observe theories. So you have the first line there. You should really stick to your data and not say anything more than that. And that's, a lot of scientists would do that. They would want to stick to their data and only report what the data say. And maybe they don't even want to make causal claims because once they make causal claims, they're moving into theory. Okay, so if you want to be a strict empiricist, data is really good to stick with. So that would explain why mechanistic knowledge is very far down on the pyramid, of the evidence-based pyramid. Uh, from that kind of perspective. If you're a strict empiricist and a positivist, you wouldn't place much uh, trust in causal mechanisms because you cannot see them. You cannot see the law of gravitational attraction, but you can see what happens when I drop this pen and then you can report how many times it actually falls when you drop it, you know? And that's not saying something more than what we can trust. So that's a uh, way to do this. So on Hume's understanding of causation, causation is something that pushes the effect through over a variety of contexts. So that would be a reason why we would think that randomization <coughs> is a good approach to finding the real cause. Because if something is a real cause, then even if everyone here is different, the paracetamol, if you take it to cure a headache, it should cure most of the headaches. You know, even if we're different. 
So even in different people, <coughs> the same kind of cause, if it's a real cause, it should give you the effect that you wanted. Okay, so for Hume, uh, if he wanted to know that causation happened in a particular case, if I want to know that the paracetamol cured your headache, I would have to look at what happened elsewhere. So other people, because he needs repetition, needs it to happen again and again. So you'll have to gather some data about other people who took paracetamol and who got their headache cured. So if he can see it happened elsewhere, he has a reason to say it happened here. So that would give a priority to covering law. He has a universal theory of causation where he starts with the causal law that C causes E, and then he would, appro he would apply that in individual cases. Okay, so you start from the, the, from the general. It's not so, I mean, that's not just something you do in, uh, in uh, medicine. I mean, it comes from theoretical physics. Uh, we look for laws. Of course, we know that in reality, these laws, they don't always work. I mean, they often work under very idealized conditions. When you isolate the cause and take away all the contextual factors, so most of these physical laws, they are not going to help us to do actual, make actual predictions in reality, but they will te tell you what would happen with very precise accuracy if the conditions were ideal. Okay, so that doesn't work so well in the special sciences. It doesn't work so well in biology either. And in medicine, it's very hard because ideal conditions, when do you have them? So, when we developed our theory of causation, we thought, well, theoretical physics, that has been now defining science since Galilei, at least. Uh, isn't it about time that we have a theory of causation that fits the more messy reality that we're actually living in? So instead of going for this kind of robust regularities and ideal conditions and these laws that are universal, general, and apply everywhere and nowhere, we thought that it seems that in reality causation is quite different. Causation seems to be something that can be interfered with. It seems to be extremely context sensitive. So imagine throwing a cigarette butt on a gas station, if there's some benzene fuel around, you know, compared to when you're out trying to light the bonfire in the rain, you know. So it's extremely context sensitive when you light your match. What's going to happen? You know, a little spark in one context gives a huge explosion, and in the other context, you know, nothing. So, and we thought, if causation is like this, then why do we keep looking for these robust regularities that are context insensitive, isolated, ideal? Um, yeah. Okay, so we, we uh, I heard about some years back when I met Roger. I heard about the uh, problem with RCTs uh, as evidence for finding causes, and at the same time I heard about medically unexplained symptoms, which are kind of conditions that are, they don't, they cannot find a cause for these conditions. It's like non-specific low back pain, tension type headache, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, is that how you say it in English? Uh, you know, a lot of diseases. These illnesses, there are like 30% of these, 30% uh, of all health complaints that are taken to the doctors, they are medically unexplained. So it seems like a huge problem. And we were thinking that, well, if we start from a different ontology that we have here, where we say that complexity and context sensitivity and the possibility of causal interference, you know, and causal singularism where causation starts in the concrete. If we take that as a starting point, then these medically unexplained symptoms, they start not becoming so much a problem as symptomatic of causation. 
And I, and I started talking about this to, to people in medicine. They said, well, these medically unexplained <coughs> symptoms, yeah, they're very, you have extreme individual vari variations, you have extreme complexity, uh, it's, uh, it's medical uniqueness, but most conditions are like that. Most complex conditions are like that because you will always have the set, your unique set of genetics, you're going to have your lifestyle, you're going to have your situation, and I say so cancer, heart conditions, they're also extreme variations, you know, maybe not as extreme as these medically unexplained conditions, but still, so why don't you look at them? So yeah, we thought that if we start from a different ontology, we could also maybe give some support to a more person-centered approach. I'm not saying personalized approach because that carries with it a bit too much about the medicine where you try to screen the genetics, but we say person-centered because it takes uh, the whole person into account and uh, it has focus on the context, on the individual and also on more qualitative evidence. Uh, so we're here talking to Rani Anjum, who's uh, uh, delivered a, a great philosophy uh, talk at Cause Health today. Um, so we just got a few questions, if that's okay, based on some of the things that you were speaking about, Rani. And, and the first one would be something that's talked about on Twitter quite a lot, and, and certainly in clinics. But how, how would you ensure that this whole argument of it's context specific, in inverted commas, is not used as a get out of jail free card for those who want to do whatever they want within healthcare? Oh yeah, I see what you mean. So if you want to do different things to different patients or different doctors yeah. do different if things? If you're doing something that is maybe not considered mainstream evidence-based practice, for example, but okay. you have a thought process which justifies your, your practice. So you kind of pick and choose your theory and then yeah, you... a bit of cherry picking and yeah. confirmation bias and things like that. Yeah, which is... Uh, I mean, that's the same kind of problems you have with data, isn't it? But it's very true. Course, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so I can try to answer that in a, in a clear way. Um, so the idea of this, uh, the way that we think of causation is that causation is about understanding uh, what is already there, the qualities uh, that are doing the work. So for instance, uh, Roger Carey was mentioning in his presentation that when we talk about a glass breaking, that's a typical case of causation. But what is doing the causal work isn't necessarily just that the glass was struck, because that sounds like it was just the thing that was done to the glass, that was the cause, and then the glass breaking was just the effect. So in our view, causation is about the properties of the things and the properties of the things that they interact with. So causation is both an internal matter and an external matter. So that he used the example of the glass and said the glass is fragile. And when that fragility is manifested because it is struck by something hard, then we call that the effect. So it's, it's, it's contextual in that sense because it's about what is already there. So you can, if you take a hammer and you knock on different things, they're not all going to break. Okay, so in that sense, it's contextual. So the cause will bring about different effects in different contexts. So you can also think of heating. So if you heat plastic, it might melt. But if you, uh, if you uh, heat up a person, they will sweat. If you heat up uh, some cookie dough, they will bake, you know, which is nice. Uh, and other things like metal would expand. So, so the intervention that we might call the cause, uh, it brings about different effects in different contexts. So what we're saying then is that the way it is context dependent, for instance in, uh, in medicine, would be that different patients bring with them different things to the causal situation. So if you have like a standardized intervention and you say this intervention I'm going to use on everyone because statistically and on average and ideally it's going to bring about this effect on everyone. Yeah. Okay, and in reality, you know that, well, maybe not 
pregnant women, maybe not old and sick people, maybe not if you're in this kind of medication, maybe not if you have some allergy or if you have uh, a mutation, you know? So, so it's not saying that you can do whatever to whatever, it's more about finding out more about the patient and their context, so what they bring to the causal situation. So if you hear that, for instance, uh, someone has an allergy or someone uh, uh, has been through an intervention before that was damaging or hurting them, then you wouldn't want to do maybe the standardized intervention. So if we think that it's more scientific to do the same to everyone, <laughs> you know, that would work if everyone was the same, because then you have same cause, same effect. But if you say that the patient brings with them maybe most of the causes, most of the causally relevant factors to the situation, and the intervention is just like one extra thing that is added, then you might want to think differently about, I mean, same cause. When do you ever have that? You wouldn't even have the same sets of causes. So, so do you see that being a place for more case studies or longitudinal case series based research as opposed to the sort of uh, numerical data churning of random and randomized control trial and systematic reviews do you see that do you have a particular preference on where that should sit on the hierarchy of evidence yeah so i would say that when you use statistical data it indicates where it could be interesting to look for causation but the statistical data alone are never going to give you causation on a silver plate i mean so we know that some of the most robust correlations we could possibly find find they are not causation so for instance, uh, we know that there's an almost 100% correlation between uh, the margarine consumption in uh, America and the divorce rate in Maine. It's 99.97% yeah. correlated, but we don't think it's causation. No. But the birth control pill, it gives thrombosis, it causes thrombosis in one in thousand women, but we still think that that's a cause. So it's not like the statistics itself is like, giving you anything. And it's so, the significance of the outcome as well that that sort of drives that so that the, the risk of having something like a stroke from a birth control pill is quite a significant. Yeah so I mean because if you if you look at uh, when you don't have it versus when you have it then you can see that it's some kind of consistency mm. in more people getting thrombosis but yeah I just think that uh, Sometimes in uh, the evidence-based hierarchy, it seems like the causal mechanism to understand how and why causes bring about their effects is not considered very important. And then one would use examples such as, well, you know, we know that smoking causes cancer, but we didn't know why when we discovered it. We discovered it through statistics. But if we take the same for uh, medical interventions, and we say, for instance, all I'm going to check is whether this drug works, and then you try to positively confirm it many, many, many times, then you might look at short-term effects and see that it works, but you don't know how it interacts with the body and what it might do to you long-term. So if it turns out it has some damaging side effects, it destroys your lungs long-term, yeah. you know, maybe you don't want to have that headache cured short-term, yeah. you know, in that way. So. The kind of evidence I would be interested in for finding causation is what could help us find causally relevant factors. So if we think that all, cause, um, all causal processes can be interfered with, then it would be interesting to put the cause in different contexts and see when you don't get the result. Yeah. Because then, you, uh, so we call it understanding causation by way of failure. So if you think of a light switch, you can switch it and then the light comes on and you can do it 100,000 times and you can think this has taught you that this light switch is causing the light to come on. I mean, what have you absence. actually learned? What have you actually learned about how it does so? Yeah. So if it doesn't turn on, the more important information is, well, why hasn't it turned yeah, on? Yeah, so if it, doesn't, if it doesn't turn on the light, then maybe you can check what's going on here yeah. and you might look at uh, wire that comes down you might look at the socket maybe there's a short circuit you know there could be different things maybe the light bulb is black or maybe it's broken and then you learn about oh all these things are actually causally relevant for this and that so you know once you can for instance see that 
in these contexts you don't get the effect even when you have the intervention that's where you should really look it's not a negative yeah. result it's actually a very it's a important yeah. it could be an important result yeah so um, we have on the project we have um, we have one pharmacologist uh, Eliana Rocca and she is interested in uh, side effect studies being made more available and also negative results in pharmacology yeah. and uh, we also have a philosopher uh, Samantha Copeland who works on serendipity and serendipity the typical thing there is that you make a lot of scientific advantage when you know you are not getting what you expected so you know sometimes the really interesting results it's not where you're looking yeah. you know it's not just confirming what you thought you already knew you know that, that's great I think that, that's something that I think more people should be looking into and and if they were to do that how, how would they find out more about the work that you're doing or the, the cause health work how, how would they be able to find you online very easily how, how would they contact you oh yeah oh, okay so we are all uh, very active on Twitter Rani Lelanian and uh, we also tweet from the cause health account and we organize all these events and uh, we pod no we don't yeah we don't haven't podcasted so much lately but we blog great yeah so yeah that's something that i'm sure we could share the links to yeah but thanks very much for, for doing that and thanks very much for the talk today it was really in insightful okay thank you thanks